Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the front row. My name is Jamie Williamson. I'm a professor here at Scripps Research Institute, and I'm very pleased to be your host for this afternoon's talk by Professor Barbara Mason on alcohol use disorder. Now, uh, this, this is a great occasion for us. Um, we're returning to an in-person event. We've got a, a great group that's joined us here in person at the Scripps Auditorium. I think for the last three years, we've been entirely virtual. Uh, and the, it's sort of a good news, bad news thing. Um, the, the good news is we were able to expand our audience. And there's routinely been eight to 800 to 1,000 people uh, on, on, the, on the webinars. Uh, the bad news was we lost that sort of intimate feeling and then the ability to join and gather outside and have some refreshments. So it's a great opportunity for, for you to visit the campus and meet some scientists, and we usually have a great group that gathers after the event. So for those of you who are local and would like to join us in person, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, and for those of you around the world, uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. Uh, we always get people from all, all around the world. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a real uh, pleasure to be, to be back in person. There's a lot happening on campus for those of you who came here. We have a new building that's going up right next door, probably a year or so. Uh, it, it should be done, but it's a brand new laboratory building. It'll be a little easier to get in and out of here uh, once all of the construction is done. Okay, so, so today's uh, talk is about alcohol use disorder and, and doing clinical trials to try to develop new medications. And, you know, who, who in the audience, both here in the auditorium and out there in the ether, who in the audience has not been affected by alcohol? Either themselves, their immediate family, or your extended social network. We all know someone who's really had a tremendous problems. So this is a serious uh, affliction. And, and so why, why do people drink? For many reasons, and they're, they're, they're listed in here. I think for most of us, it's a social effect. We, we enjoy having a drink with friends and talking. And, and really the issue is uh, what happens when you, you, you overdo it. And here's just some numbers. And I think, I think the most remarkable one is the last one. Well, okay, 6.4% of Americans are heavy alcohol users. Well, folks, that's 20 million people, okay, that are really struggling with, with alcohol and the effects of it on their lives and the lives of those around them. So I think this is a, a, a major medical need. We have an institute at the NIH for alcohol abuse. In fact, Director George Kube of that institute's still on our faculty and he's uh, here in the audience today, so welcome. So it's a major medical need. And, and I think some of the, Barbara's gonna tell you some really interesting things about the way clinical trials are developed and about the new medications that are, that are coming out. It's not just about the drinking and the after effects, but it, it, there's all kinds of intersections of abuse of alcohol with other disease areas. And so those people who are prone to this tend to have increased uh, risk of stroke and liver disease in particular. Now, I think probably the most interesting and also the most challenging aspect of addressing alcohol abuse is that it's really uh, centered around the brain. It's a really complicated problem. It involves people's behavior. It involves their psychology, and perhaps even their dis disease state, their mental health. Uh, and it also involves physiology. And now if you imagine bringing all of those things together and you're trying to develop a therapeutic, now you have to introduce pharmacology. So Barbara's gonna tell us some really interesting things about the challenges and the opportunities, and it's very exciting. Uh, uh, and and I, think, I think you'll all be really interested in what she has to say. So at the end, we're gonna have Q&A. And uh, we'll be sitting over here in our fake living room and I will uh, uh, take questions from the audience. And we'll take questions, I, I'll have an iPad, people can text, I'll be getting questions that you can type in online. Now, before I, before I 
say how to do that. Uh, the one thing I gotta make clear to everyone is this is a basic research institute. Neither Barbara nor I have an MD, and so we can't advise anyone to, for a particular course of treatment. We can provide you resources for how to get information about that, but we can't answer those kinds of questions. My uncle does this, what should I do? We can't really engage in, in that discussion because we're engaged in the basic research of drug discovery. So for those of you in the audience here, there'll be microphones, and I wanna encourage you to feel free to ask questions in person. And then for those of you uh, in, in the virtual audience, you can type your questions into either the chat or the Q&A. And those are gonna get fed to me at the end and we'll have a little discussion when I come back. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Barbara Mason. Barbara, come on up. And I'll see you at the end. Thank you, Jamie. See you on the other side. Thank you so much for coming. And Jamie, thank you for that really comprehensive introduction. So I have a PhD in clinical psychology from Long Island University. I did my dissertation research and a postdoc in psychopharmacology at Cornell, where I learned clinical trial methods in the Department of Psychiatry. And my first NIH-funded grant was a clinical trial which showed that people with both alcohol dependence and major depression had significant improvement in both their depression and drinking when treated with antidepressant medication compared to placebo. I was recruited to the University of Miami School of Medicine where I earned professor with tenure and conducted the NIH-funded original clinical trial showing nomophene significantly reduced drinking relative to placebo. And nomophene has since been approved by the European Medicines Agency as a new treatment for alcohol dependence. I also served as the overall principal investigator for a 21 center trial conducted in support of FDA approval of a camprosate, which is the newest FDA approved treatment for alcohol dependence. So all of these positive experiences showed that there could be new avenues to treat alcohol use disorder. And I took these insights with me to Scripps Research um, where I was recruited by Dr. Floyd Bloom, who is chair of the Department of Neuropharmacology, with an assist from Dr. Ernie Boitler, who is chair of the Department of Molecular and Experimental Medicine. Dr. Bloom's goal was to make neuropharmacology a fully translational department aimed at medication development for substance use disorder. And my goal is to influence the practice of medicine by developing novel medications to improve treatment of alcohol use disorder in collaboration with the outstanding basic scientists working in the addiction space at Scripps Research. My work transforming treatment options for alcohol use disorder takes place in the context of a number of key resources at Scripps Research. First, I'd like to express my appreciation to Mark Pearson, a philanthropist and member of the Scripps Board of Trustees, for his incredible generosity in, in creating an endowed chair for me not long after I moved to Scripps Research. At that time, I was being recruited back to Cornell, and the Pearson Endowed Chair solidified my commitment to stay at Scripps Research. The TSRI ARC, um, which is the Scripps Research Institute Alcohol Research Center, which is funded by NIAAA, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, is now in its fifth decade and is comprised of seven multidisciplinary laboratories focused on discovering the neurobiology of alcohol use disorder and corresponding treatment targets that inform my clinical work in alcohol use disorder. In addition to the NIAAA funded center, Mark Pearson funded the Pearson Center for Alcohol and Addiction Research 
which serves as a resource and a fraternity for scientists who share an interest in medication development for substance use disorders, regardless of whether or not they have their own NIH funding. Alcohol use disorder is a newer term that encompasses the conditions referred to as alcohol abuse, alcohol dependence, alcohol addiction, and alcoholism. It's characterized by an impaired ability to stop or control alcohol use despite adverse social, occupational, or some of the health consequences that Jamie uh, discussed earlier. It's considered a brain disorder and is on a spectrum of severity, ranging from mild to moderate to severe. Lasting changes in the brain caused by untreated AED can make individuals increasingly vulnerable to relapse to drinking. Understanding the neurobiology of alcohol use disorder can guide the development of novel, safe, and effective treatments. That's the premise that our center operates under. The latest epidemiological uh, survey estimates that nearly 30 million Americans met criteria for past year alcohol use disorder. And alcohol misuse costs the US economy $250 billion annually due to such factors as lost productivity, medical care, and law enforcement costs. And the Center for Disease Control conducted a review of medical examiner reports and found that over 140,000 deaths per year are classified as alcohol related, with half of all deaths from liver disease being caused by alcohol, and 20% of suicides are completed during alcohol intoxication. To me, it's shocking that less than 10% of Americans with alcohol use disorder get any treatment for alcohol use disorder and that fewer percent, fewer than 3% of Americans with alcohol use disorder are prescribed one of the three FDA approved medications to treat it, which are disulfiram, naltrexone, and acamprosate. These are the three FDA approved medications for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Each has demonstrated a greater benefit than placebo in clinical trials and therefore should be considered as part of a comprehensive treatment plan for alcohol use disorder. Each drug works by a very different mechanism of action. Disulfiram acts as a psychological deterrent by making you sick if you drink during treatment. Naltrexone decreases the rewarding effects of alcohol so that people drink less. And in Camprosate reduces craving associated with protracted withdrawal and promotes abstinence. Despite demonstrated efficacy, these drugs do have their drawbacks, like any medication. In addition, given the diverse biological processes that contribute to alcohol use disorder, new medications are needed to provide a broader spectrum of treatment options. Some people may respond to a drug that helps with craving. Others may respond to a drug that relieves impulsivity. Others may respond to a drug that reverses the negative emotional state of protracted withdrawal. As you will see, uh, this is the focus of our work, the negative emotional state of protracted withdrawal. So George Koo, um, a former director of our alcohol center at Scripps and the current director of NIAAA, brought order to chaos by conceptualizing a three-stage cycle of alcohol use disorder. The binge intoxication stage, followed by the withdrawal negative affect stage, followed by the preoccupation anticipation or craving stage. The stages correspond to the underlying neurobiology of addiction. I added the corresponding clinical stages where binge intoxication is followed by up to five days of acute withdrawal if a person quits or cuts down a lot on their drinking. And that's followed by a period of protracted withdrawal 
that includes negative effective symptoms such as anxiety, dysphoria, irritability, and sleep disturbance, any one of which can increase craving and risk of relapse. Our center has taken the lead in showing that early recovery is a high risk time for relapse due to the activation of brain stress systems in the amygdala that drive the emotional misery of not drinking in a brain that has become dependent on alcohol. And other than a campersate, there are no FDA approved medications for reducing the risk of relapse in this protracted withdrawal phase. But any of the brain stress systems that become overexpressed in this stage could be a drug target for treating alcohol use disorder. And these are targets in the negative emotional state of protracted withdrawal that we're studying or have studied in my lab and within the alcohol center. And these compounds are the focus or have been the focus of my research and the thrust of my talk. And you can see from this slide the wide range of targets for treating the protracted withdrawal stage of alcohol use disorder. Because unlike most substances of abuse, there is no alcohol receptor in the brain, which is pretty surprising. I mean, for opiates, you have the mu opiate receptor Many substances of abuse have their own receptor that they bind to and activate, and you can either block it or replace it. But with alcohol, the drugs that show promise do not have a common mechanism of action, which underscores the complicated nature of alcohol use disorder. An exciting project we have going on in my lab is interrogating the clinical databases and biological specimens from these projects with the aim of identifying biomarkers of relapse risk or resiliency that could guide the optimal choice of treatment for an individual. And this slide is to give you a glimpse into some of the exciting targets under investigation in the laboratories of, of alcohol center investigators that I will not be covering further in today's talk, but wanted to give you a glimpse of them. Um, Eric Zaria and Luisa Bertotto are studying the kappa opioid receptors role in alcohol use disorder. And Dr. Zed Roberts and Hugh Rosen generously agreed to pro provide an analog of their kappa opioid receptor antagonist that they are developing as a novel antidepressant medication for evaluation in Eric and Luisa's animal models of alcohol use disorder. And I have to say this is an example of the amazing collegiality and spirit of collaboration that you can easily find at Scripps Research. And Remy Martin Fardone and Francisco Flores Ramirez are diving deep into the hypocretin erexin system that was originally discovered in the laboratory of Floyd Bloom, the founder of our alcohol research center. Remy and Francisco also generously collaborated with my lab on the design of a clinical proof of concept study in this domain. And Olivier George and Candice Conte um, showed the effectiveness of a novel neurosteroid analog to decrease drinking in rodent models of alcohol use disorder. So lots of targets, lots of exciting uh, strategies under investigation. And the overall goal of the Scripps Alcohol Research Center is to identify neurobiological mechanisms mediating alcohol use disorder by bringing a multidisciplinary focus to the less well understood persisting heightened neurobiological stress response and impaired cortical control that drive relapse and early recovery. The overall goal of my lab is to translate the Alcohol Center's basic research findings to the identification and clinical evaluation of medications that target the stress response and the associated symptoms of anxiety, dysphoria, insomnia, and craving that heighten relapse risk and early recovery. 
So clinical trials are long, expensive, and disappointing when they are negative. <laughs> so George Koop, when he was professor at Scripps, and I obtained funding to develop parallel animal and human laboratory models of risk factors for relapse and protracted withdrawal to serve as a rapid screen for assessing the therapeutic potential of drug targets identified by TSRI ARC. And this is what we call a Rosetta Stone approach, where there are iterations between the animal and the human laboratory models to inform each other until ultimately we make a thumbs up, thumbs down decision on nominating a, a potential medication for further investigation in the longer, larger, more expensive phase two or three clinical trials. And clinically, our strategy has become to test the most promising small molecules directed at neurobiological targets for protracted withdrawal using an early phase proof of concept human laboratory model of protracted withdrawal in non-treatment seekers with alcohol use disorder. And if we get a signal in that uh, screening model, then we'll go on to conduct the randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial and people seeking treatment for alcohol use disorder who also receive evidence-based counseling. So the human lab models, both internal and external risk factors for relapse. Our subjects are non-treatment seeking male and female volunteers with current alcohol use disorder who are abstinent for three days prior to testing on the last day of drug dosing. And we verify that with the urine dipstick that detects the presence of a metabolite of alcohol, alcohol glucuronide that's present for as long as 80 hours after the last drink. And our design is double blind, placebo controlled with random assignment to the study drug or placebo. And uh, the duration of dosing is never less than one week, never more than two weeks. It's based on how long it takes for a steady level of drug to be circulating and uh, gives time if dose titration is needed. So internal risk factors for relapse are those emotions that can trigger um, a return to drinking. And we use images from the International Affective Picture System projected on a monitor in front of the volunteer. And then their preferred alcoholic beverage is presented and they're asked to view and smell it for 90 seconds without drinking it. And then on the monitor appears four visual analog scale questions about the severity of their craving that they just click on a computer mouse to indicate how strong um, their craving is at that moment in time. And when I think about a potential medication I'd like to study in humans, I want a small molecule that crosses the blood-brain barrier with no abuse potential and no interaction in case a person has a slip in drinks while the medication is in their system. We want a good safety profile, good tolerability, and good patient acceptability. It's a dosing regimen that they can manage. And um, we study oral route of administration. And before I test any medication for research purposes in humans, I have to have the protocol and medication used in the protocol uh, approved by the FDA, um, either by granting me an IND, an investigational new drug permit with waiver of an IND. And of course, it's also uh, reviewed and approved by the Scripps Research Institutional Review Board for safety and the highest adherence to ethical standards in human research. The first drug that we studied in this new screening model was gabapentin. It was interesting to me because it's one of the most widely used drugs 
in the world for the treatment of neuropathic pain. And I thought that perhaps alcohol use disorder might be treated more if there was a medication available that most physicians were used to working with. I was also interested in gabapentin because it's used off-label to treat symptoms so associated with protracted withdrawal, such as depression, anxiety, and insomnia. And like a camprosate, it's not metabolized in the liver and has good safety and tolerability. Marissa Roberto is a member of the Alcohol Center who showed that in alcohol use disorder, gabapentin modulates GABAergic activity to restore homeostasis and brain stress systems using animal models of excessive drinking during withdrawal. And if you'd like to take a deep dive into Marissa's work in this area, as well as her work on the interaction between inflammation, stress, and alcohol use disorder, you can find a recording of Marissa's front row lecture from August of last year on the Scripps website. I encourage you to watch it. So in our human laboratory study, our volunteers were randomized to 1,200 milligrams of gabapentin for a week or identical placebo. They were tested on the last day of dosing. And what we found was that those volunteers who were randomized to treatment with gabapentin had significantly um, less craving relative to those treated with placebo, less of impulse to drink relative to placebo, and less feelings of loss of control over their urge to drink relative to placebo. We also found that gabapentin significantly improved sleep quality, sleep latency, and sleep efficiency relative to placebo with no elevation and next day drowsiness. So based on these results, we went on to conduct a double blind placebo controlled 12 week treatment trial of gabapentin in 150 individuals who were seeking treatment for alcohol use disorder. And all of our participants received 12 weeks of weekly individual evidence-based alcohol counseling and at the same time, they were randomized to medication treatment with either placebo, 900 milligrams a day of gabapentin, or 1,800 milligrams a day of gabapentin. These are the lowest and highest FDA-approved doses of gabapentin. And what we found was that gabapentin had a significant linear dose effect where patients treated with placebo had the worst outcome on the two FDA uh, outcomes that they evaluate for treatment of alcohol use disorder. The rate of complete abstinence, no drinking at all over the 12-week study, very few people treated with placebo and behavioral counseling were able to meet that endpoint. And you can see how it improved with 900 milligrams, but was superior with the 1,800 milligram. And the other FDA outcome, no heavy drinking at all, which is four more drinks a day for women, five or more drinks a day for men, was met by nearly half of the patients randomized to the high dose of uh, gabapentin, the 1,800 milligram a day dose. Um, and this was a large effect size relative to placebo. We also found significant linear dose-related reductions on measures of mood, the Beck Depression Inventory, sleep, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, and craving, the alcohol craving questionnaire. And after these results were published, in the Journal of Internal Medicine, again, trying to reach out to uh, the widest audience of potential prescribers. I was invited by the American Psychiatric Association to present the results to their board of trustees at their headquarters in Washington, DC. I didn't know why. And um, in the next few years, uh, these results were replicated by 
a number of laboratories around the country and in Japan. And in 2017, the American Psychiatric Association published their first practice guideline for the pharmacological treatment of patients with alcohol use disorder and included the recommendation that gabapentin be offered to patients as a treatment for alcohol use disorder. And as a function of this recommendation, gabapentin is now available as a treatment for alcohol use disorder in the Veterans Administration uh, formularies and reimbursable as a treatment for alcohol use disorder under many health insurance plans. So the next medication I'd like to talk with you about is mifepristone, which is prescribed chronically for patients with Cushing's disorder. Totally different than gabapentin. Functions as a glucocorticoid receptor antagonist for the purposes of alcohol use disorder and blocks the overactivation of the brain stress systems. And this was work done by Leandro Vendrasculo and Olivier George, who were postdocs at Scripps and each have their own laboratories now. Leandro at NIDA, where he's tenure track, and Olivier George at UCSD, where he is a tenured professor. And given their uh, characterization of mifepristone and the function of the glucocorticoid receptor antagonist, in animal models of alcohol use disorder, we thought that administering it following acute alcohol withdrawal might normalize the brain stress axis, thus protecting against drinking relapse. And what we found was that um, one week of mifepristone, 600 milligrams a day, um, decreased craving and response to alcohol cues relative to placebo in our laboratory study. And we always followed drinking on drug and for the week off drug to make sure that going off drug doesn't result in rebound drinking. Instead, we were really surprised to find that one week after the last dose, people treated with mifepristone had very significantly reduced drinking during that week relative to those who had been treated with placebo. So we went on to conduct a double-blind placebo-controlled trial uh, in treatment seekers with alcohol use disorder with the aim of extending the findings from the human laboratory study and identified predictors of response because this was completely new terrain. And we had noticed in the laboratory study that the higher the level of mifepristone that was circulating in your system and in plasma, um, the greater the reduction in craving. So we definitely wanted to look at plasma mifepristone level as a predictor. And also now we're introducing factors such as motivation. And so we looked at the treatment goal of quitting drinking or not. And we always look uh, for sex differences. And in case I forget, let me just say now that we have not found sex differences in, in any of the drugs that I've studied. And that's important, and I might forget to say it with each drug, so I'm saying it now. And after we had that surprising finding about the reduced drinking off drug, we did a deep dive into the investigator brochure for mifepristone and found that it has a half-life of 85 hours and requires about two weeks for elimination after chronic dosing. So we hypothesized that a week of treatment with mifepristone would reduce drinking and symptoms of protracted withdrawal. That could then be given in conjunction with eight additional weeks of evidence-based behavioral counseling for alcohol and that this might be a very cost-effective uh, treatment paradigm for alcohol use disorder. And what we found was that the red line is those who had the highest plasma concentration of mifepristone, the blue line is placebo, that those who had the highest concentration did not escalate their drinking during the week on drug and it stayed somewhat suppressed. Um, remember, four or more drinks a day for women, five or more drinks a day for men, the risk level. Um, so the high level 
of mifepristone plasma did hold the line in terms of alcohol intake as it did in the lab study relative to placebo and lower concentrations. But at the two week point when the drug had cleared the system, there, there was no effect sustained by the behavioral therapy. And the last drug I'm gonna tell you about today is a premolast also known as Otesla, which is FDA approved for psoriasis at a dose of 60 milligrams taken orally. You may have heard the TV commercials. For the purposes of alcohol use disorder, it works as a selective phosphodiesterase type four inhibitor that acts on immune system targets to reduce inflammation. It gobbles up like a Pac-Man. Preclinical studies and computational genomic analyses identified PDE4 inhibitors such as Rolopram and Butylast and Promolast as having therapeutic potential for alcohol use disorder. And I was interested in studying a Premolast because it's the newest of uh, drugs in this class and the molecule was tweaked so that it would have less severe gastrointestinal side effects than the early PDE4 inhibitors that um, would have such severe nausea that people would leave treatment. Um, and so I thought, given a Premolas um, improvement in this area, it would have better acceptability as a treatment for alcohol use disorder. And I worked with Yuri Blednoff and colleagues at the University of Texas, Austin, to. Uh, identify the optimal dose. Um, Yuri did dose ranging studies in animal models and uh, he identified a 90 milligram a day dose for testing in humans, which is 50% higher than the psoriasis dose. But I have learned the hard way not to underdose for proof of concept studies. And what we found was a very large effect of a premolast on reducing the number of drinks per day over the 11 day study period relative to placebo, uh, which had a very negligible uh, reduction in drinking. A premolast also significantly reduced the proportion of heavy drinking days uh, relative to placebo. And when this study was published a number of months ago, it generated a lot of excitement because um, Bob Innes and NIH had just developed a pet ligand for the PDE4 receptor. And um, so seeing this potential for treating alcohol use disorder and maybe other substance use disorders as well uh, generated uh, studies within NIH, and I've been working with a, a center, an alcohol center at Yale, uh, to replicate this because I learned from the gabapentin experience that it's really great to facilitate um, replication studies and studies that expand on your work because it makes it more likely that uh, a drug will find its way to the people who could benefit from it. So to summarize, the clinical studies of gabapentin, mifepristone, and apremolase that I showed you reduced drinking relative to placebo, reduced negative affect, insomnia, and craving, were safe and well tolerated, and provided clinical validation of the preclinical models in that Rosetta Stone iterative model. They also validated the novel conceptual approach of Arakul Center at Scripps drug targets from the protracted withdrawal phase that return brain stress systems to homeostasis are an exciting and innovative approach to developing medications to treat AUD. And our clinical trial results support the predictive validity of the human laboratory model as a screen for drugs to potentially reduce relapse and protracted withdrawal. So to conclude, these are some of the phases of clinical testing for a drug to become available for use by patients. These are the medications for which I've been involved in the clinical trials that facilitated these drugs becoming available as treatments for alcohol use disorder in pharmacies. Here's what I showed you today. 
and here's what's in the clinical pipeline. And we're not done. As you could see from the teaser slide I gave you, there's a lot more in the pipeline and coming from the basic scientists of the Scripps Research Alcohol Research Center. And I want to express my appreciation to the individuals who volunteered for these studies and the Scripps Research Institutional Review Board who oversaw the safe and ethical conduct of, I think, 15 clinical trials now in our lab. And I want to acknowledge funding provided by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and the Pearson Center for Alcohol and Addiction Research. And it's difficult to get everyone all in one picture, but I think I've remembered to include everyone's name. And I'd like to thank the members of my lab who worked on these studies. Raise your hands. You're here. I know you are. Let people know who you are. <laughs> And um, I'd like to thank the members of the Alcohol Center. Together, we share a vision of developing novel treatments to help people with alcohol use disorder to lead healthy lives. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Barbara. Ja Jamie, may I just say one more thing? Oh, absolutely. Desi McCoy, who organizes this great event, created this QR code so that if you're interested in learning more, um, it's great resources. So help yourself. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. OK, thanks, Barbara. Let, uh, take a seat. We'll have, we'll have some questions. Uh, I have a few that are, I've got queued up from the virtual audience. Uh, we'll take some. There's microphone runners that will appear. So uh, you know, just stick your hand up. We want this to be a safe space for, for questions. But I, I want to kind of ice break. I want to I ask you something. Um, and, and so when you started your career, there were hardly, as you indicated, there was hardly any medications. And so now, you know, you, and you've had several that you worked on come to the market. Um, but, but one of the things that you said uh, that really stuck in my mind was there was this sort of log jam in screening people for the clinical trials because they, you, you couldn't put somebody in a trial if they were suffering from depression. And yet we all kind of know that there's this inextricable link between depression and alcohol use. But it seems, so, so could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's a really important point. I didn't appreciate that, that, that it was so stratified. So is that still the case? And, and, are, and, and you did mention that there's counseling in your clinical trials now. Mm -hmm. So somehow that, that got worked through. So, so that's a long question, but, but I thought it was a really interesting thing. So how, how did that evolve? Yes, so it is true, when I started out, um, there was disulfiram, mm -hmm. which is the medication that makes you feel sick if you drink, and that would really only be available if you saw an alcohol specialist, which is very rare, and Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And um, the conventional wisdom in psychiatry was, well, aren't, isn't everyone with an alcohol problem depressed? And if you just get them to stop drinking, won't the depression go away? And so that's why doing that work was important because it did show that not only did the depression not go away, but you were more likely to relapse to drinking if you were treated with placebo. And that the antidepressant did treat the depression of the major depression in people with alcohol use disorder. And um, so I learned that people with an alcohol use disorder can participate in clinical trials, which really opened a universe to me mm -hmm. that you know I just found so rewarding mm -hmm. because the response, the effect size of, of response is very comparable to that of antidepressants. And it's really rewarding right. to see people yep. really that's, that's regain a, their health a and huge recovery. Sea change over, yeah. over your career and how this has been approached. Okay, I, I saw a hand. 
Uh, we have down, down, down here in the front. Um, it, let's see, maybe I'll, while we're queuing that up. Um, yeah, so here, this is, a, so this is an interesting, uh, should be a quick question, but uh, you know, a clinical trial is an experiment, and one of the things that you did was show people, a, you know, some pictures, and, and you said you did it for 90 seconds, and so someone in the virtual audience asked, how do you choose 90 seconds? Oh. So, um, so I mean, it, it, it's, obviously you pay a lot of attention to the detail of designing your protocol. You bet. <laughs> so, so just give us a little window into what goes into designing that experiment. Um, actually, the uh, exposure to the pictures uh, is fairly rapid. It's the beverage exposure that's 90 seconds. And I have served as um, like the patient <laughs> many uh -huh. times for training purposes. And 90 seconds is quite a long time. It's a long time to stare at a drink. And smell yeah. it. Yeah. It's the olfactory cues that I, are really. I, I don't usually yeah. last that long. No, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Okay, I shouldn't, I shouldn't joke, but I just can't. Help. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, please. Yes, I'm from the Coachella Valley of the Center of Rehabs. And um, I've read that the Sinclair method in Finland has been proven, been published very successful using naltrexone. They claim 75% success. I'm not sure I believe that, but it's successful. Of all the hundreds of alcoholics I've heard and know in the Coachella Valley, one person is using it. The problem is you might find these very useful drugs, which sounds like they are, getting the, the, the clinical part going and getting them to work with these drugs and prescribe them. I mean, not uh, yeah, so cheap. That's a, that's, a good, that's a good point. If I may, Please yes. Please answer, yep. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm feeling more and more encouraged by some developments that have occurred. I mentioned, for example, the American Psychiatric Association getting really frustrated by the limited treatment options and, you know, kind of taking that bull by the horns. But also, Vivek Murphy, our current um, Surgeon General, was also Surgeon General during the Obama administration, and um, published the first Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health, and recommended a chronic care model for alcohol use disorder, much like for diabetes, where you have you know, counseling to support the lifestyle changes that are necessary in the medication to reduce craving and the risk for relapse. A chart gets tagged for the chronic disease, and response is monitored at every patient visit so that if greater, greater intensity of care is warranted, you know, it, it's just like, why not? You know, it's a progressive, potentially fatal disorder, you know? Right, right. And then the last point I'd like to make in response to your comment is that first the American Psychiatric Association created a subspecialty in addiction psychiatry and they are the individuals most likely to prescribe these medications. But more recently, the American Medical Association created a subspecialty certification in addiction medicine. And so with these subspecialty certifications, it's brought in over 10,000 more physicians who are able and are familiar, they're able to work with these medications and are actually even aware of them. So um, I do feel like there's more of a groundswell coming to diagnose and treat alcohol use disorder. Are they bringing in primary care physicians? That's who has to do it. Yes, I agree with you. The question was, are they bringing in primary care physicians? Yes, there is a big effort underway in many, uh, aspects of the federal government to encourage this program called ESPERT, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment for every adult over 18 years of age in every primary care practice. And you know you, they've gotten really good about asking how much do you drink, right? <laughs> so they have the S nailed. <laughs> but right. the brief intervention and referral to treatment 
you know, that QR code has um, on it an NIAAA program called, uh, I think, the Physician's Core Resource, something like that. It provides CME credits for 14 modules. And um, it really is very helpful in helping to make people who are in the front lines of interacting with people with an alcohol use disorder more aware of how to do the brief intervention or referral to treatment because they have scripts that you can just follow and you know make it happen. Uh, thank you for the great question. Um, I have one that I'll tee up from a, from the virtual audience, and and you know one you described all these different medications and you know they they target all these different physiological parts of the body. I mean ones for inflammation, you know other it. And so, and you described it as, well, okay, it's a complex disease and there can be many ways to intervene. So the, the question from the viewer is very insightful. What about combination therapies? Oh, yes. And, but, and so d just practically, do you have to do now a clinical trial on the combinations or can a physician simply prescribe two medications? Well, and I mean, well, you answer. <laughs> physicians can prescribe two medications. Uh -huh. um, that's within their. They have very different mechanisms, but they might be synergistic or yeah. at least additive. And, yes. And and so that's all. I mean, I to to build on the previous question. You know, it strikes me that the physicians aren't going to be catching up to all of these new things coming out. So how do how does how do you get the message out? Let me just acknowledge that Remy Martin Fardon, yep. who's in the higher seats, yeah, is um, actually uh, studying uh, combinations of uh, uh, medications in his research component. And I told him when he made the kappa opioid receptor antagonist, corticotropin releasing antagonist, and was it hypocretin receptor antagonist combo? I'll be there, <laughs> but um, anyway. So I'm going to aggregate a couple of questions from different different viewers. Okay. But but it all it all kind of comes under the umbrella of <clears throat> in your clinical trial. How do you, how do you deal with issues of compliance? And you know, are they taking the meds? Are they you know are they accurately reporting the drinking? Are you know are they getting different counseling on the side that may have you know how, and so it's kind of a I guess it's a big variable but how do how do you deal with that in yeah. your in your experiment? It's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so in terms of are they taking their medication, we package a week's supply of medication in a blister card that the person and the blister card it tells you the day in the time of day that the medication is to be taken and uh, people return the blister card at their next appointment. And that way we can identify if there's like a particular dose that's being missed and, and do an intervention like, well, take it when you brush your teeth at night, you know, just tie it in with an activity of daily living. But then we also uh, look at the level of drug that's circulating in the system with a blood draw, you know, that assays the concentration of drug and plasma, which is, you know, a verification that they're taking the medication. Right. And in terms of drinking, we use a combination of self-report using a calendar style interview and a standard drink format. A standard drink is like based on the alcohol content. We're at 12 ounce. A uh, can of beer is equal to five ounces of wine, which is equal to an ounce and a half of distilled spirits, as, as I said, based on the alcohol content. And we train our, our participants to know what a standard drink is and use the calendar style format to um, obtain that information. But then, as I mentioned, er, we have the alcohol glucuronide dipstick, and we also breathalyze everyone as soon as they come into the lab, be, no prejudice, you know, everybody gets it. So we can tell if people have been drinking on that day, but 
the alcohol glucuronide dipstick that can tell you up to 80 hours to the last drink is as far out as we can go with direct biochemical verification of drinking because alcohol is metabolized relatively quickly and we don't want people to be coming every 80 hours. So um, <laughs> what we do is look for indirect measures of drinking and one of which is um, a liver enzyme that you can detect in the blood and it can be just sent out to LabCorp along with your regular panels. And um, if it's sensitive to recent heavy alcohol use, it's not perfect because if you had like red hot chili peppers for dinner the night before, it could be elevated. But um, mm -hmm. still, okay. <laughs> it's like an indirect indicator to follow up on. So, so we're, we're coming up on the hour, and I, I think I'll just close with one final question. Uh, you know, you, you described alcohol use disorder a, as having a spectrum, and we all know people on various ranges of that spectrum. And so that points to something uh, about individuality of response to alcohol and medications. So what, what is the state of knowledge on the intersection between genetics and our you know, DNA sequences that people are mining and, and, uh, and treatment and clinical trials? Mm, that's an excellent question. Remember I said about how opioids bond to, bind to the mu receptor? Well, that's also the receptor that's involved with naltrexone. And um, so people have looked at the EOPR1 gene as a predictor of um, response to naltrexone and alcohol use disorder. And it's been frustrating because you'll have a positive study, a negative study. Uh, someone did a study that completely selected for people <laughs> with the gene, and it was a negative study. So um, we're not quite there yet for reducing you know, genetic predictors to clinical practice, mm -hmm. but there have been some very encouraging pharmacometabolomic said it, mm -hmm. <laughs> studies um, that showed that high serum glutamate levels predict a group that's likely to be very high responders to a camprosate. So that's exciting, you know, mm -hmm. and we are, we do have work underway uh, looking for biomarkers of response to one treatment versus another. Okay, Including terrific. in our yep. group. <laughs> yep. Thanks. Uh, uh, so I think, um, I think we'll, we'll end it there and I just, want to thank everyone in the virtual audience and the present audience for, for coming. Uh, I want to remind you that our next front row lecture is September 13th, and that's Ahmed Badran, and he's going to be talking to us about using uh, molecular evolution to uh, combat some serious global problems. It'll be a horse of a different color, but it's very exciting, young scientists, so I encourage you to tune in for that, and on that day, you will find me in the front row. Let's thank Barbara. <laughs> thank you.